I mean, we do have a lot of similarities, actually, to where we were in 94. Um, it was the midterm year of a newly elected Democratic president whose uh, you know, numbers were sliding in the polls. We saw oil shoot up very big that year. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And what we saw, in, we also, obviously, that was the last time we saw the 75 basis point hike from the Fed. Um, and the S&P actually ended up closing only down about 1.5% that year. And if you look at what had happened the following years from 95 to 99, the market really boomed every year. Um, so, we, you know, uh, we always say the past doesn't, history doesn't repeat, but it often does rhyme. So there's some interesting similarities there wow. uh, with where we're at now versus 94. I've been hearing the rhyme pretty good with uh, 2000, the, the later end of that post-94 uh, boom. Dollar breaking out, Fed having to stamp out uh, frothy markets and big companies uh, leading the way down in tech. Uh, but you're saying if it's the other side for 94, then the party could just be getting started. I think so. I mean, you, you know, you bring up an interesting point. We're definitely seeing some similarities with, with 2002. Uh, crypto, I think, is a great example. You know, you saw a lot of speculation into these new, innovative, uh, disruptive technologies and other things that I think, you know, you could kind of equate more to the dot-com bubble. Um, but I think if you look at earnings right now, I mean, S&P earnings are forecast to grow by 11% this year. Small cap earnings are forecast to grow by 20% next year. So I think we're definitely on stronger footing. Um, and stronger fundamentals than we were, you know, after the dot-com bubble burst. Where do you think uh, uh, these uh, types of uh, uh, trades will uh, end up in terms of the best place to put your money? If you're going to put it in stocks as an asset class, because you mentioned small caps, right now the debate rages on, do you buy the dip in the uh, big tank or the small tank, or do you go with the stuff that's actually been working here, but maybe expose yourself to some crazy swings and stuff like crude oil? Uh, so where do you put the money if it's going to go to equities? One place we really like right now is small caps. Um, if you look at what's been happening with large caps, you know, they're down a little bit over 20% from their highs in January. Small caps are down over 30% from their highs in November. Plus, looking at valuation, small caps are right around the same valuation as large caps. But as I mentioned, you know, earnings, earnings growth in large caps is projected to be 11% this year and about 9.5% next year. Small caps are projected to be 20% next year. So even if the multiple doesn't change, you know, you're looking at plus 20% growth in that sector just based on earnings growth. Hmm. Um, and it's really trading at a deep discount to the market right now. When you look right now at the uh, potential for the Fed to keep uh, its path forward and possibly induce recession, some of the language over the last week from Powell seemingly is uh, bringing that to forefront where he had tried to dodge some of that potential uh, risk uh, in his analysis before, but seems pretty straight up about it now that maybe we could uh, dip into recession. Uh, do you have to model that out uh, in your analysis? Uh, what does your team assign the odds of either a technical recession or uh, us getting through it? Um, you know, it's hard to put a number on it, but I think recession is not really likely, although, you know, headlines would make you think that it's a foregone conclusion. Uh, we have pretty strong household and corporate balance sheets right now, really tight labor market, low unemployment. A lot of uh, forecast earnings growth. Um, and we're already starting to see some deflationary pressures in commodities. I mean, we saw last week crude oil futures were down about 9.5% or over 9%. Um, copper was down 8.5%. Copper's down, I'm sorry, copper was down 6.5% last week, but about over 18% since its highs in March. So if we start to see some of these commodity prices coming down, that's deflationary. And, you know, a lot of other inflationary pressures we've seen have been related to supply chain disruptions and COVID restrictions. So if those things start to come down and kind of tighten financial conditions on their own, I think that's going to allow the Fed to be a little bit more dovish and, you know, not bring the economy to a screeching halt. Glad you mentioned copper, uh, one that we haven't talked about enough here today, but down two and a half percent. I guess if you're not alarmed by this copper sell-off, you don't believe in the Dr. Copper adage that this is a bellwether for the global economy. Uh, at least the way I learned, copper breaking down to New Year lows with some ferocity is never anything particularly good. Well, I, there's no question that we are seeing a slowdown, right? We're seeing growth slowing, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean recession. And I think that that's really what we need, right? We need some of these commodity prices to come down and some of this inflation to come down um, to really right the ship and really prevent the Fed from going too far too fast um, with, with their tightening. So I think ultimately that's going to be a good thing. How much of the uh, commodity complex should be represented 
uh, in an equity uh, allocation at this point, because a lot of people have been arguing here over the last several months it should be pretty big. People that didn't really have much interest in energy commodities uh, suddenly wanted to chase that rally here the last six months. So far, it's generally worked. But as you point out, and as we see in some of these prices, uh, it uh, take it the way too. Uh, so what do you need to have in your equities allocation to hedge against that potential that commodity prices just keep going up? That's a great question. I mean, you definitely want to have a balanced, diversified portfolio. We're really asset allocators. You know, we don't believe in following the trend or, or, or chasing, you know, rising or falling markets. Mm. Um, but you need that inflationary hedge. I mean, that's the biggest thing that long-term investors need to combat with in their portfolios long-term is inflation. Um, so I would say commodities, you, you know, you probably want to have about 10% exposure there in your equity portfolio, um, along, with, along with things like real estate, um, to, to really provide that inflationary hedge that you'll need long-term. Do you guys believe uh, uh, gold or any of the uh, uh, crypto Bitcoin stuff serves any purpose beyond uh, adding risk to a portfolio? Uh, crypto, no. I mean, I think if you talk about investments, you know, we're investing in companies or real assets that are producing, they're, you know, they're generating revenue, they're generating dividends um, by, you know, selling goods or services. Bitcoin, in our view, crypto, I mean, it's not producing anything, it's not generating any income. Uh, we'll own gold as a broader basket of commodities, but I wouldn't, you know, own gold as a play in its own right. Okay, all right, there we go. A uh, optimistic bullish case that uh, uh, doesn't include Bitcoin. A healthy reprieve. I like it. Okay, Aaron, thanks for the analysis. Appreciate it. Thank you.